Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Connected by T Community, brought to you by Ballantyne Capital Advisors. I'm one of your hosts, Anthony Koncheco. With me is Ann Thompson, and we have a special guest, Steve Hole, with Find Great People. Welcome. Thank you. Great to be here, and thanks for having me. I'm excited about this topic because we are always hiring at, uh, at Ballantyne. <laughs> and this Let is me a write that down. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to know. And uh, the, the everything is... Seems like it's changing quickly, but before we jump into find great people, and what, uh, tell me a little bit about yourself, personally and professionally. Okay, well, uh, my family moved to Greenville when I was seven, so that was yeah. back in 1974. So I've been in Greenville for uh, about 50 years. Um, back when Greenville was not cool, <laughs> <laughs> and nobody knew anything about it, and uh, had all of my education at Bob Jones from second grade through college. Wow. Met my wife in high school uh, there. Uh, married her, and so we've been married for 32 years. No kids, two dogs, um, <laughs> and have been at the same company really since college, so that's 34 years. Wow. Um, so that's a little bit about... You don't see me. that anymore. No, <laughs> <laughs> you don't see it, and... Um, it's sad because mm -hmm. uh, our, our current younger generation thinks they have to keep moving. Mm -hmm. And I would say that companies are also hungry for people who know how to overcome adversity and stick through it mm -hmm. and come out on the other side. So I can say that I've lived through that, and, and I'm grateful that I can say I've been at one company my mm -hmm. whole career. Now, how long has Find Great People been in business? So we've been around for 40 years. We okay. just started our 41st year, wow. and it was established here in Greenville. Oh, great. So you've been there, what did you say, 35? 30, 34. So 34 most of the, out of the 41. So you must be uh, one of the top 10 hires, right? Uh, <laughs> I don't know if it's fair to say top 10. I would say that I'm the longest tenured <laughs> uh, of the bunch, followed by my sister, actually, of 31 years. Oh, wow. So I've worked with my, my sister for quite a long time, and that's been a tremendous blessing. It's a great privilege. She's the, um, she's the smarter of the bunch, <laughs> and, um, but at the same time, really, really, truly love working with her. My niece now works in the company, so that's a, a neat thing. Um, it's, it's becoming a family affair. It's, it's, it's been a family affair, <clears throat> because as you can imagine, you know, whether no matter where we are as a family, we're always talking about business. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about what Find Great People does. So we do three things. So let's just try to make it simple. Yeah. We find talent. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, we help develop and retain talent. And then third, there are those occasions where you might need to say to some talent, it's time for you to go. And so oh. we transition talent. Wow. So in a nutshell, yeah. those are the three things that we do. That's very focused and very distinct. Yeah. Now, I know some people that work at Find Great People. Um, one of them is actually like an HR manager, but she's not an HR manager for Find Great People. She's actually outsourced to other companies. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you think about the three things that we do, you have a front door, which is the find part, the finding right. of talent, the, the talent acquisition, as we call it today. That's the front door. Mm -hmm. And really, over the last several years, that's where all the focus of most organizations have been. And that may be true of your company. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, then you have the back door. And what I find frequently is the back door is either ajar or it's wide open or it's swinging back and forth. So as fast as they're coming in, they seem to be going out, whether that's of their own choice mm -hmm. or of the choice of the organization. And that's where our transition business comes into play. There's an appropriate way to let somebody leave, and we provide a humane, compassionate way to do that. The middle component, or inside the house, if you will, is that development and retention component. Mm -hmm. So you didn't mention the name of who you're thinking of, which is fine. But my guess is that they are part of our FGP consulting division, which is partly outsourced HR consulting mm -hmm. for small to medium-sized organizations. Or we do project work for large organizations um, who have a, a full-blown HR department. Right. 
Um, and then third, on the retention and development component is how can we make the team that we have better? And so we've got an extensive amount of experience in executive coaching and leadership development, supervisor training. So there's a lot in there, yeah. but the person you're talking about sounds to me like they're, they're dealing with our outsourced HR service. She is. She is. Yeah. Uh, and she's been there a while. Not as long as you. <laughs> do you, do you want to give her name credit? <laughs> Shelly Harash. Shelly's amazing. <laughs> and i um, glad to call her a colleague. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very nice person. Our, our children played basketball together. So. <laughs> yeah. I remember the days of her girls playing ball. Yeah. yeah she's still in it. I'm out. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All mine are in college now. So uh, no more, no more Tuesdays and Thursdays at the gym. So you hear a lot in the news about jobs and unemployment and um, national numbers. And I, I think the October jobs report just came out like a week ago. Yeah. Uh, and it was kind of mediocre, mm -hmm. but it was still positive. Um, how does Greenville stack up to the national numbers? Well, the state of South Carolina as a whole stacks up quite nicely. Mm -hmm. um, the downside is is that they lag behind data a month or two beyond. So that those, those jobs reports came out Friday, yeah. and South Carolina do really won't get us information for another month or so. And so that that that's a bit frustrating because yeah. it, it, it's a little bit too late. Um, that being said, Greenville in particular, um, the last I looked at this, which would have been about a month ago, Greenville in particular was somewhere around 2.8% unemployment. Wow. Um, Spartanburg is going to be in the same vein. Charleston is going to be in that same vein. Um, Columbia, really not much different than that. So that's as, a, as a state... Uh, we have been under 3% this whole year and really for the last year or two. So I, I would just say South Carolina is doing fine. Mm -hmm. um, the last time I looked, there were about 79,000 or 80,000 unemployed, at least knowingly unemployed, right. where they have data in the state. And we have a population of about 5.1, 5.2 million so that is tight. That is really tight. Yeah. In Spartanburg County, you could conceivably only have about 5,000 unemployed individuals in the whole county. Mm -hmm. So we're talking a really tight labor market, even though, to your point, Friday's numbers were below expectation. Right. Um, I just read an article this morning about Friday, and they were actually trying to cast a silver lining in that, um, that, that things may be turning in a, in a positive direction, or at least let's just say the need for talent is still high, the supply is still low, and really that's probably not going to change for several years. Okay, that's interesting. How, how do you, um, where do you see that changing? Do you see AI impacting that at all? So The, the, the key word of like the last, I feel like, six months is AI. So. Yeah, <laughs> so, the, so the, the two letters, AI, Yeah. Um, they have me on pause, right? I, I'm not all in, yeah, mm -hmm. let's go, mm -hmm. as it pertains to the industry that I sit in. And the reason for that is because we really don't know what to do with it other than people are experimenting. And so there is value in people who want to sort of be on that bleeding edge. Mm -hmm. um, I was on a, a global call two weeks ago <clears throat> with some partners that we are a part of. Um, our firm is the only U.S. partner for an organization called the International Executive Search Federation. So there are 26 member country partners that are search firms, mm -hmm. and we do cross-border referral work with each other. And um, we were just in Singapore about a month ago, and the subject of what do we do with AI was a hot topic and so we've, we've started a task force, and we're just trying to figure out, get our hands around, well, what are all the possible ways that this could be used, and what are all the tools? Mm -hmm. Some are free, some are not. Um, but the pause that I have is, is at least within our firm, <clears throat> we're studying it too. Mm -hmm. And if we're not careful, we may be actually promoting information that's not accurate about an individual, 
or believing something that's not accurate about an individual without doing the vetting. So since our product is people, mm -hmm. so to speak, um, I personally feel like we need to be very careful right? Um, because our, our company stands for values mm -hmm. and integrity. And if we just embrace it full on, I, I think mm -hmm. we're going to be asking for some some not so pleasant outcomes. I feel like that's the environment that everybody's kind of like, ooh, let's hold on, yeah. let's reevaluate this and look at this in more detail. <laughs> let's look at pandemic for a second. So you've been in this industry a long time. You've seen a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. um, I hear a lot of comments um, from news and from individuals about the direction of work from home versus go back to an office. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> where do we stand right now with that? Um, how, how has the pandemic changed things and, and what will stay permanent change and what won't? What, do you, what are you seeing out there? All right, so since you're asking all the questions, I'm gonna turn around and ask you both a question. What is your policy at Ballantyne? Are you all in, are you hybrid? Or are you 100% remote? All yes. in. Yeah, so due to our industry, mm -hmm. we're people people, mm -hmm. right? So um, we have clients that stop by, right? Mm -hmm. So we yeah. are all in. Um, but we do have the ability to take our laptops, and if something were to happen in the building and we test that, test those systems, yeah. we have that ability, but we are 100% in the office. And this is where I struggle when, because I do all the hiring. <laughs> right, right. Um, <clears throat> this is where we're sh sort of struggling is trying to get folks back in the office. Yeah. They say they want to be back in the office until you get to the final stages of, well, I really want a hybrid <clears throat> role. Yeah, right. So um, 2020, <clears throat> you went hybrid, right? I mean, you went 100% remote. Am I correct? Mostly? Sure. Okay. <laughs> for, for government and tax purposes, the answer is yes. Um, I see what's going on here. Even I found a way to get a haircut during the, <laughs> during the lockdown, right? Yeah. But it was backdoor entrance only, right? Um, <clears throat> so this is t statistically what's going on out there. Recently, there was a study done, and I was surprised. 60% of all U.S. workers are five days in. Okay, but that now, doesn't seem like a lot. I mean, that's a lot compared to 40%, but... So so 60% all in five days, 28% hybrid, 12% okay. 100% remote. That did not feel like the 100% remote wave mm -hmm. yeah. that from the candidate world we've been sort of hearing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right? <clears throat> so in the last six to 12 months, mm -hmm. these, these things are changing. And um, it does really come down to types of functions. Mm -hmm. So if you're in the information technology space, I think you can still say, no, I'm not coming in. And um, companies have a harder time mandating that you do. Uh, we were doing a search in Texas not too long ago for a controller for just a 12-person company, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the CEO who was new but didn't live locally wanted that controller to be in five days a week. We had a difficult time finding any candidates mm -hmm. because they wanted the remote, not even hybrid. So it's a constant struggle. There's a great tension um, throughout the whole country because our work is not just local. It's all over the U.S. Right, right. And <clears throat> so what I would say to you is my, my feeling is, is that hybrid is the sweet spot. However, the labor shortage is not going away. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is a demographic issue, and most people just aren't paying attention to the statistics of this. Mm -hmm. My generation, without pulling the two of you in, I don't know your generation. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm leaning more towards your generation. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to say you're not baby boomer. Um, so my generation X, mm -hmm. there's about a 4 million gap of births from my generation to my parents' generation. Mm -hmm. We can't make that up by birthing a baby today mm -hmm. and having them on the job tomorrow. We just can't do that. Right. 
the next major wave is the millennial and the Gen Z categories. Mm -hmm. And by 2025, so coming up soon, about 70% of the U.S. workforce is going to be comprised of millennial and Gen Z. Wow. By 2030, so what are we talking, seven years or so? Yeah. It's closer to 90%. Wow. Because hopefully I'll be retired, right? <laughs> um, and, and people in my generation or some of, some of us. There is a tremendous uphill climb to transfer all this knowledge if you take just me as an example, and I'm not trying to put myself up as an example, but just my tenure, mm -hmm. um, having been at the company so long, been through so many evolutions of our company, right? because most of our growth has come in the last 20 years, mm -hmm. I just have a lot of experiences, and I can't easily exchange that over Microsoft Teams or Zoom. Mm -hmm. I need to be able to walk down the hall and say, Hey, Joe, can we chat for a second? This just happened, and let's talk about how we might go about that differently or what I learned from that. What are your thoughts about that? Maybe we're working with the same client. That's invaluable. Right. And, and there, there were periods of time when we were in the heart of the COVID. Uh, there were only 10 of us going into our office at that point in time, mm -hmm. um, and I was one of them, and I was glad to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I did not want to be at home. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can do that, but imagine this in, in my mind. I don't want to roll out of bed, slip into my comfy shoes, shuffle across the hall to my office, then shuffle down the hall for lunch, then shuffle back to the office. I have no segmentation in my life that way. Yeah. Granted, I do get the opportunities to be around family and, and do some things otherwise, but after a while... That, to me, is monotonous and boring, and I don't want that. I, mm -hmm. I need people. I want to be around people. Yeah. It was killing my husband. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't hear from your husband, so I'll just take your word oh for that. Oh, my gosh. He, um, he, was, he was a bear to deal with during <laughs> COVID. We need him out of the house on many occasions. <laughs> well, so during that phase of life, um, most of our 100 or so teammates were remote, mm -hmm. and you couldn't just... Um, send them a quick IM and say, hey, can we hop on a virtual call? That was much more challenging. And so the timeliness of passing along information, right. it's almost like I had to schedule a call. So that's where companies are really struggling, mm -hmm. is how do we hand off this, really this management leadership transfer of knowledge to a younger group of folks who just haven't been exposed to as much because they are very quickly going to be in these seats. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, that's, that's why I think that this whole movement to a hybrid is really going to be more helpful. It's great points. As a small business uh, owner, how, how do we retain folks? Because as you know, they, they, younger folks like feel like they need to change jobs. So how do we transfer that information, yeah. but they don't really want to stay very long? Yeah. So there's something, I think, really positive about the Gen Z category in that generation that we are observing. Um, they went through the whole lockdown effect mm -hmm. of college, most of them that are, that are old enough to be out in the workforce. They don't want to go through that again so much. Um, an example of this, in our company on Tuesdays and Thursdays, we hire a wellness coach to come in, and it's either the parking lot or our, one of our large conference rooms. And there's usually anywhere from you know six to a dozen or fifteen or so people from our team, and they're all mostly younger. And they go do the hour of exercise together. One day I was leaving the parking lot about five o'clock because this starts at four, <laughs> and as I'm heading to the car. Um, I hear from the crowd in the parking lot, I'm referred to as Uncle Steve a lot because we have a lot of young young talent. <laughs> in the team. And so it's Uncle Steve, come over and work out with us. And, and I said, no, no, I'm, I'm good. I was going to the gym to work out by myself. They wanted to work out in community. Aww. So what we're observing about that Gen Z crowd is, is that 
they they do like the idea of some flexibility, mm-hmm. but they don't really want, uh, as a whole, they don't mm-hmm. generally really want to just be by themselves in work. Um, they are very concerned about mental wellness. Mm-hmm. No surprise. What did they experience during their college years, perhaps, that caused a lot of that anxiety? So on one front, that's sort of an, an answer to the remote work, 100% remote mm-hmm. uh, in-office stuff. Um, as far as the retention component, though, we have found you really have to seriously invest in people. Mm-hmm. You have to ask person by person, what is it that you want to achieve in your career here? And it may be that they would like to take a cooking class, which has nothing to do with investing, but you say, you know what, we're going to support that. We've got a stipend of, of dollars that once a year you can apply to whatever you want to do. And that's what we would call individual development rather than we're, we're approaching them all as a block mm-hmm. and they're all going to do the same thing. And I think individualizing that or customizing that might actually be workable to keep some of the younger talent who feel the need to grow and change, they may not feel the need to actually leave to do that if they're constantly being given that opportunity. Mm-hmm. That's a great idea. Hadn't, hadn't thought about that. Haven't seen that. Um, usually organizations are supporting you if you're working towards um, something in your professional right. career, not right. necessarily an interest that you might have in your personal career. So I consider that old school thinking. Yeah. Um, and I and I believe that with millennials and Gen Z, we, we need to be a lot more creative in how we address what makes you feel fulfilled. Mm-hmm. Um, the younger crowds are very also humanitarianly driven. And so as an example, this um, Friday, we have a, an, a company event. It's our th- <clears throat> Thanksgiving lunch day, right? Yeah. But we're going to spend two hours before that uh, in, in a give back to the community and we're just being dispersed to different charitable organizations to, for two hours to, to show that we care about the community because we're interested in that. Well, since the majority of our company would fall into that Gen Z millennial section, mm-hmm. um, it's apparent that they also feel that that is an important part of what it means to be an FGP teammate. So okay. now we're getting into the culture component. And again, that's where working remote is the struggle. You don't have the unique advantage of culture anymore. Mm-hmm. And I would submit that if you don't have that, then really you're left at a, at a tremendous risk because the only difference between me saying I'll stay with Ballantyne or I'll leave now comes down to what are you going to pay me? So right. the loyalty gets really thin at that point. And that is what I think mm-hmm. most executives and companies around the country are wrestling with. Yeah, that's super interesting. Um, I like to hear that. I mean, people are getting creative and um, looking for different ways to make people happy in, in their jobs. Or, mm-hmm. I mean, their jobs, we spend so much time there, it's our community. Right. Uh, so work is as much of a community as as it is going home at night at 6 o'clock and, and walking the dogs down the cul-de-sac and meeting your neighbors. Well, you spend more time, at, mm-hmm. technically, mm-hmm. you spend more time at work. And, and if somebody would want to challenge me on that, I would say, okay, well, when you do get home from work or you quit work, whatever that looks like, how many hours do you engage in conversation with family, friends? And it's, you know, it's going to be about a four-hour window. Right. And then we all hit, hit to bed, right? Right, right. So um, for, from my early years of being at FGP, people would say, you know, why don't you just go out on your own? And you've been doing this a long time. And uh, one of the three reasons why I've not left FGP is because of the people that I work with. Right. When I don't love those people, then I need to leave. Mm-hmm. And I'm happy to tell you that the people that maybe in the past weren't as lovable are no longer there. <laughs> um, that's sort of the comedic relief side of that. That's not true for everyone who's come and gone from our firm. But mm-hmm. uh, I don't have many conflicts. But uh, I'm there because of the teammates that I get to yeah. work with. So if I, you know, if I'm a small business owner and I want to, 
hire, you know, what does F, you know, fine gray people do for me? What, you know, maybe you could explain the process sure. of being a small business owner, hiring, what, what do you do? You know, do you help with figuring out a package with maybe we're hiring younger generation and we need to, we're old school thinking and we need to fine tune uh, some of the offers and stuff like that. Do, does fine great people help with that? We do. So it doesn't require a conversation with Shelly Horoski nece- yeah. necessarily. <laughs> yeah. Now, if, um, if she is your outsourced HR leader, then guess what? She's the first person that I would run to. And she's already going to be making suggestions anyway. Mm-hmm. But um, I was on a conversation with a, a, a South Carolina-based company yesterday about some, some new hires that they are desperate for. In other words, they have more work than they have talent to handle it. Mm-hmm. And it's just not getting any easier. And so, interestingly enough, while we were certainly – fascinated by what the titles were, what the compensation would be, what the job description looked like, what the background was that we need to find. My interest, first and foremost, was talk to me about your company, talk to me about the culture, Mm -hmm. Um, because if we don't understand that, and there are some things that perhaps could be adjusted with just some suggestions, because we are in these conversations every single Mm -hmm. day of the week, and we've been doing this, as you mentioned, for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. We have over 600 client organizations that we work with around the country. We have put people in 46 states and 14 countries in our 40-year history. We have worked with one man or one woman startups to Fortune 50 at Walmart corporate headquarters and everything in between. And so I'd like to think we have some thought on how to do do this and how to go about it and re- and really Anthony in recent years the whole compensation component has been one of the bigger nuts to to tackle because of wage inflation um, some of it appropriate and some of it as you are grinning at me a little bit <laughs> inappropriate um, but we need to explore the makeup of your organization and and how you're set up, how you're structured in those conversations, as opposed to, well, just send me the job description and we'll get you five candidates. Well, first Mm -hmm. of all, we don't say we'll get you five anymore because that's hard. But if we're doing our jobs appropriately, we're trying to understand what problem are you trying to solve? Let's start with that. Mm -hmm. And then why would somebody want to come work for you? And through that discovery process, it's possible that we'll hear some things about how you're currently set up or how you're conducting life that we would say, you know, for this role, we might just ask, you know, have you thought about this or would you change that? Would you be open and receptive? Why? Because we know the candidate market is going to be looking for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it could be everything from benefits, um, certainly to the remote or hybrid or all-in component, Um, certainly compensation, but it might also be about what are my career opportunities? If I get in there, how long will it take for me to grow? Mm -hmm. So lots of different ways to address that. And yes, we do take care of that. Awesome. So I have um, two college kids. One is... Good for you. (laughs) Senior. What advice would you give them coming out of college? Okay. Um, (laughs) So two weeks ago, I was speaking on a Friday night on a college campus with a small group, about 15 to 20 students Mm -hmm. that are specific to HR. They're business majors, and they've got an HR concentration. I was really impressed. Um, So that was a Friday night. On Sunday morning, I get a, a LinkedIn message from one of those youngsters who's attended And his question was, can we meet and talk about my future career path and plan? Right. Only to find out he's a freshman. He's a first semester freshman, (laughs) which really took me back. And I was so impressed by that. And for 30 minutes on our conversation, it, it became evident to me the first thing he needed to do was go to LinkedIn and work on that because he had only one connection, which was one of the other panelists from that night. Yeah. So depending on the circumstances, you know, some of them just don't appreciate or understand how valuable a tool like LinkedIn is. Mm -hmm. It is the only tool for 
almost all of us in business. And it's how you get discovered. In our business, we find talent through that keyword searching. So if your LinkedIn profile is slim, you're making this really hard for, for you to be discovered. Right. Um, certainly with your child's situation, I'd mm -hmm. be wanting to know, okay, well, what's your major and, and what do you think you want to do? And really from there, I'm interested in how, how are you going about building your network? Because that's really going to make the difference. Right. Yes, there are more jobs than there are people. There's, there's something like, as of recently, 9 point something, 9.5 million jobs open, and about half of that unemployed. So in, in statistical theory, there's plenty of work. Right. But people are frustrated by not hearing back when they apply. Mm -hmm. I've heard that from her with internships, summer yes, internships, for sure. that yeah. she'll apply, 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 and yeah. very few actually get back with her. Right. So um, an internship was going to be on the to-do list, right, that yeah. I was going to mention. Um, I got an email from uh, a friend the other week about his son, who is also graduating and needs to get an internship. And, hey, does FGP do, intern FGP do interns? And the answer is, of course, we do. Um, so every, it's on every college to-do list right. and, and most parents. But I shared with them a book that really changed uh, really my life in terms of my career um, about 15 years ago. It's called Never Eat Alone. It's just a great title, but it's a book on networking by okay. a gentleman who was struggling. I think in that case, it was more about he was trying to make sales and meet quota, and it wasn't going well. This is my recollection from the book. But it, it captivated me for a week at the beach where I, I read cover to cover, which is not my routine. <laughs> and it just made so much sense. His whole objective is to become a super connector for others. And so that's what I set out to do 15 years ago. And um, not only have others benefited from my doing that, but I've benefited and my firm has benefited. So that's one thing that I would be saying to any student. How many people do you know? If you don't if you don't have a network to work with, well, then you're stuck with the application process. Mm -hmm. And so far better for, in this case, my friend, for me to go to our team and say, are we hiring an intern this year and sort of sponsor him in? That's vastly different than the voluminous amounts of inquiries that are coming through email or applications just on the internship level. Right. But the same is true on the job level. Yeah. Well, thank you. And these I call them kids. They're not kids anymore. No. Um, young adults. They're young adults, and they're very good at social media. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to doing social media on kind of a professional scale, they're not very good at doing it. You have to think differently when you're doing a professional social media post yeah. than you do when you're doing it college for yourself. Fun. College for fun. College fun. <laughs> right. Uh, and, and they don't believe me when I say, um, you know, that stuff that you're posting is probably inappropriate and there's, there's people that are going to look to hire you that are going to look on your social media posts, right. not necessarily LinkedIn, but your Facebook, your Instagram, your Snap. So be careful what you post. Absolutely. Um, it's, you have to lock things down. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I can imagine Anthony, in your case, uh, again, not knowing the station of life that you're in, but <laughs> if someone's coming right out of college, um, I think we have um, for too long been comfortable with the idea that all of us who are veterans, we are the ones who need to adjust. And for the, the hiring process, I would just say, I think they need to understand what is the love language of hiring because very few of their peer group are the ones making the decisions mm -hmm. to hire, yeah. right? Yeah. So I, I think it behooves them to actually do a little bit more work on their part mm -hmm. to make an adjustment on what are the what's the language that Anthony will understand for me to be noticed and for me to be taken seriously yeah. as a candidate. And I'll say this, you know, every candidate that I do get, I do go on LinkedIn and actually look them up. So sure. it's, <laughs> Absolutely. I'm sure others are doing the same, but you just want to, just see that they have a presence and, you know. 
And what kind of presence. Yes. Yeah. Even if we personally might have a, a, a slightly different set or more flexible set of values than the company we work for, the company has a set of values. There's a brand image that every mm-hmm. company, whether they like it or not, has. Mm-hmm. And so you have to appreciate and understand what that is. Uh, doesn't mean you have to wholly embrace or identify, mm-hmm. except for when you're working and be mindful of that. And so that means that all my social media needs to somehow reflect uh, some of that identity with the company that I work for. Right. When you're in high school and college, you're, you're just not thinking yeah. about that. And we've all made decisions that we regret, but we're about to be in the workforce mm-hmm. and we really need to take that seriously. Mm-hmm. Right, right. So we have kind of like a key question we like to ask mm-hmm. everybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, is, what is something that makes you tick what are you passionate about? There are things, multiple things, right, that, that in my case, that bring me enjoyment. Uh, I, I really enjoy golf, um, so that's an exercise activity that I'm, I'm really passionate about and have been for many, many years. Um, family is important. Uh, all my family, all my wife's family lives here, so lots of connectedness oh, as yeah. a result of that. Uh, work, strangely enough, work is really, really important to me and has been for 34 years. And so it really doesn't matter where I am or what I'm doing at what time of night Mm -hmm. or morning because my international partners, they're already hours ahead of me. Right. So I'm getting messages from them when we're communicating at three and four and five and six in the morning. Mm -hmm. Um, And so as long as I'm upright, in some form or fashion, <laughs> I, just my own personal approach to life is you deserve a response as quickly as possible, mm-hmm. no matter who it is, even if it's to say no thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's a major component of what makes me tick and, and passion. And I would just say the last thing, um, this is just who I am. When I was five years old, I made a decision in life that changed the trajectory of my entire life. And you would say, what could a five-year-old possibly right, that's decide? that's what's going through my head. <laughs> Did you make an investment? Um, no. Um, but I heard the gospel as, mm-hmm. as a kid, and it made sense to me. And so as a five-year-old, that changed who I was going to be from that point forward. And so to this day, uh, consequently... That's the lens that I look through life. Okay. So all my relationships are going to be influenced by that. I'm an elder in my church, mm-hmm. um, and so I invest in people's lives. Not perfectly, but um, it's a labor of love. Mm-hmm. And, of course, I grow as a result of that as well. So those are, those are a few things that would, I think would, that my friends would say would describe me. Well, great. That's a great path that you're on, and, and you're contributing um, so much to society with with what you're doing at Find Great People, but also what you're doing spiritually and um, developing people holistically. It sounds like um, that's the that's the the goal, and it it you know it doesn't work. It's just like in our business. I I, I say a pen if it breaks, I can send back a person. If they break, I don't have a way to repair right. easily, and so. People are our product in our company, and so that's hard. And then you have that um, spiritual side of life, mm-hmm. and sometimes people don't want to change, um, yeah. and so that makes it more challenging. But uh, I am not the Savior, so we don't have to worry about <laughs> me rescuing them. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us, and thank you all for listening to another episode of Connected by Community brought to you by Ballantine Capital Advisors. Uh, we are on all social media platforms. Um, So give us a listen, give us a share, give us a a like. Um, Until we see you again, go make our community great.